Yeah, okay. And so I, I think many of these policies are really um, rhetorical exercises. It doesn't really issue any protections. If someone has a valid federal immigration detainer because they have violated a law, they've committed a crime, and the authorities are seeking to detain that person, they will issue a detainer request to uh, the county or the city, whatever, whoever the law enforcement entity is. Generally, it's going to be a county because they're the ones with lockups. So, uh, to my knowledge, no jurisdiction within New York State that has adopted these resolutions has ever told their law enforcement to ignore a validly issued detainer request issued by a federal agency. Right. At the same time, immigration laws are the responsibility of the federal government, not the local jurisdiction. So our local law enforcement are not implementing and enforcing immigration laws. Very important that we make these distinctions. And I think that so much of this is, is wrapped up in the whole con issue of of immigration enforcement. And I have, right from the start, when I was running for office last year, I said we should normalize the status of people who are in the country illegally, who have not committed a crime, and so that we can relieve this, this anxiety and this tension that exists. There are many, many good people that have come into our country, didn't come legally, or they overstayed visas. That's a separate issue. That's a problem. At the same time, you have 12 or 13 million people residing in the country who are not, did not come here legally, most of whom, the vast majority of whom, are obeying the laws, often paying taxes, and often performing jobs like in our agricultural and service sector industries that are important. So I have said right from the start, we should undertake a process where, yes, we strictly enforce the borders, try to make sure that drugs and, and criminals are not coming across, certainly, absolutely. I don't think anyone left or right disagrees with that. At the same time, we should show that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We should adopt overall immigration reforms, which would normalize the status of people in the country and give them permission to stay here so long as they're obeying the law and paying taxes, perhaps pay a fine, all of those things. I've also, by the way, co-sponsored legislation to deal with the so-called DACA children, the children who were brought here. Yeah. Uh, people were brought here as children who had... You know, if you're a four-year-old and you're brought here by your parents, you didn't have any sense of that. And 20 years later, you're 24. All you've known is the United States of America. So I've co-sponsored legislation to try to address that issue as well. So um, uh, I think this is, is issue is very charged. It's very emotional. But many of these so-called sanctuary city resolutions... You are, called them political, I think. In, in the beginning. They are they are basically rhetorical exercises, mm -hmm. having no real meaning or substance when it comes to the enforcement of the laws. Okay, good. Uh, okay, we'll move on to something that's really in the news uh, these days, and that is that uh, uh, President uh, Trump has warned uh, North the North Korean president uh, that he's got to behave, and Vice President. Uh, Pence did the same, did a similar thing, and he said that the United States has run out of patience uh, with uh, North Korea. Do you support military intervention in North Korea? Well, I, I, I think the, the bottom line is that North Korea should not have a nuclear weapon, should not be able to have ballistic missiles to deliver that nuclear weapon, should not be able to threaten its neighbors, the South Koreans or the Japanese. And they should not have ballistic missiles, which could range to the west coast of the United States and Hawaii. So I think that uh, the U.S. needs to apply all pressure that we can, uh, especially through the Chinese. Um, and we should engage in a vig vigorous, renewed sanctions reg regime on any companies or countries or financial institutions that help facilitate the trafficking by the North Koreans in nuclear parts and machinery, etc., ballistic missile capabilities. And I think that all options have to be on the table, but I think it's way too premature to talk about uh, a uh, military endeavor. With so the, you don't, you don't support a military endeavor no, right now and at I this don't, point? I don't, think, other, other. I, don't, I don't think anyone does. Okay. And um, I think it's very important. Remember, success. The, the, this administration is really pursuing the same type of policy 
as uh, administrations back to uh, George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton pursued. Notably, all of those efforts have been unsuccessful in trying to restrain the um, uh, attitude and the approaches of the North Korean government. So it's a very strange, closed, insular society. Uh, the Chinese have the most influence, but even the Chinese apparently said to President Trump, the ch uh, Chinese president, when he was here recently, uh, explained the long and tortured history between China and Korea. And it is, a, it is a very difficult question to resolve, but we should resolve it trying to use diplomatic uh, pressure mostly, military pressure partially, uh, but uh, it is way too premature to speculate about any kind of military Intervention. action. Exactly. Um, just that, you know, I, I mean, people uh, I've talked to when they see, the, you know, that parade recently in uh, North Korea with those bombs, you know, um, you know, going down the street, and the, you know, the um, um, uh, uh, the president of uh, North Korea standing there and smiling, and the goose stepping yep. uh, by the troop gets people nervous. Well, it it, it should. I mean, yeah. think of it. This is a country where uh, one third of the country doesn't have, uh, where only one third of the country has uh, even intermittent electricity. This is a country where the leader of North Korea just had assassinated in, right. in uh, Malaysia his half-brother. Uh, this is a country where uh, uh, the Kim Jong-un had his uh, uncle, who was a senior military right. or, or security official, uh, uh, put to death. So this is a very bizarre, unusual uh, regime uh, where when food aid was sent by the Clinton administration in the late 90s to the North Korean people who were then undergoing a famine, the North Korean leadership told their country this was the United States paying tribute to the North Korean regime. Mm -hmm. So this is a very bizarre culture which frankly we don't really understand and uh, very well, uh, but it, their efforts have successively stymied uh, numerous administrations of both parties here in the United States um, in terms of trying to deal with them. But I think we still have to, President Obama said to incoming President Trump uh, in January that the North Korean situation would be the most significant foreign policy challenge that, we, that he will face. And he is likely right. Right. Okay, we'll go on to another one that's been part of, uh, part of the news for some time now, uh, <clears throat> or in the news some, for some time. A recent uh, Quinnipiac poll uh, found that 67% of Americans think President Trump uh, should publicly release his tax returns, with 32% of Republicans supporting it. On Thursday, you had said, I think it was on the, on the radio, um, somewhere. It was in uh, WMHD. W, oh, right, the t TV. Uh, you said um, this concern was a Washington parlor game. Since then, more than 150 cities uh, held rallies with um, thousands demanding this happen. Uh, Arita Phyllis wants to know, do you support President Trump releasing his tax returns? Yes, yeah, I do. I said this last week. I said it last year. Uh, every president for the last, or candidate for the last 40 years has released their income tax returns. I think he should have done it. And... Um, but I have my reference to this Washington parlor game is that he obviously has refused to do it. The public knew when he was running that he did not release his income tax returns. Uh, there's no law that requires him to release his income tax returns. And uh, so the public elected him president regardless of this fact. They knew it ahead of time. How much that played into their decision, no one could really know. But I, I would definitely be in that 67% of Americans who believe that he should do it. And I uh, frankly believe that anyone running for president uh, in 2020 should do it as well. And whether we should enact a law that requires that or not, I think uh, I'm thinking about that. Uh, but I think this, what I meant by that parlor game, this is a classic Washington back and forth, tit for tat. It doesn't accomplish very much in my view or really anything. And it ignores and distracts attention away from the need to do things that affect jobs and our economy and our healthcare system and security for the United States. Uh, 
the Congress, uh, they've made their point about it. Trump ignored their point. Um, and I think we have to move on. Do you think, I mean, do you, do you think it's reasonable of people to be suspicious you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you know, he doesn't want to release his tax form because he's hiding something. Do you think that's reasonable? I, I, I think there's any number of reasons uh, yeah. why he may or may not uh, be releasing his tax returns. And I think it's reasonable that he that people are suspicious over it. Yes. I mean, I think that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I don't know that this is really a matter which requires us to, to uh, spend an inordinate amount of time to the exclusion of other things. And this is what I meant by these Washington parlor games. You yeah. had them, you have Democrats and Republicans play these games when I see it down there. And to me, it's not really, it's not really addressing the fact that our taxes are too high, that people's kids and grandchildren keep moving out of upstate New York. Those are the things that I'm concerned about.